and it drove on a long ways with that, and it worked fine. And he put a little turn signal light there and kind of hit it, and it was okay. But unfortunately, a lot of these kits, what they do is they move the wheel out. First off, it gives you track width problem. Then you've got to run a funky backspace wheel, and that creates some other problems with scrub radius and other stuff. But the other worst part of it is, is then they take this upper arm and they run it at a steeper angle. Well, you can see what it does to this geometry. What you got here is kind of everybody in the band playing the same tune. They're all rotating about the same instant center. You know, if you start moving these angles and changing lengths and moving stuff up and down and pushing them all around, this is when you get into trouble. Now you're talking about jazz. You got four guys doing a solo at the same time. Now, if you like jazz, that's fine. I find it a little confusing. I certainly don't want to drive a vehicle like this. Now, right now, I wish we didn't have this technology problem, but I've got a great little video of a car that came in. It was a Maverick that came in with a with a rack and pinion conversion on it that's for sale out there and it was just undrivable. So he brought it in with the uh, to put one of our strut suspensions. We actually prototyped it on the car and I put it on the lift and it had the fender off and the spring out, just a wood block to hold it up while they moved it. And, and we ran the car up and down and did a video of it. And you can't believe what that wheel's doing. I mean, first it goes radical toe in and negative camber and then as it continues to rise, it goes, po it just, it's just like a snake in there. It looks like it has rubber tie rods on a thing. It's just, people laugh when they see it. And that's generally my intro for, for what bump steer really is, because we talk about it. But you can imagine what it's like to drive a car with that wheel looking like it's just unhooked in there. So this is what we're avoiding. And the closer we get to ideal, well, the better. You know, you can't always get all you want. Just like in those Indy cars, they run reverse Ackerman because it just doesn't matter because of the way they use the car. But on a street car, sure does matter, sir. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very good question. His question is, as we steer this car, this tie rod moves inboard and outboard, so we no longer have this condition. But what this condition really does is establish the length of that arc length. So, and when the real factor is, is going back to the arc length theory, how much change we got in the effective length because of the cord, that's never going to change. It may move inboard and outboard, but the difference is no, the change is no different. So therefore, you get no bump steer. I, I, and I've often wondered about that. And actually, because if your tie rod is not dead level, whoop, trying to get my pointer again. If your tie rod is not dead level, now you introduce another factor. You're really changing the height. Well, we're starting to split hairs here. But at least you've got a car that's controllable. Our goal is to get something that has one driver the guy holding the wheel and not have the chassis have another idea. Because if the chassis is doing something, reacting to what he's doing, he's got to react to that and we're back to this driver induced oscillation thing here. And it's the term we use is the car squirrely. And a lot of times sway bars are fixes for that. Sir? Mm -hmm. Right. Wherever it pivots, wherever it's actually the center of the ball and the pivot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a stick figure, really. It doesn't matter if this A-arm is curved. You'll see ads for guys selling tubular arms that tell you it handles better because they shape the tubing different. That's horse hockey. Because if you don't move these pivot points around, that's, that's marketing. That, that, that's not engineering. If you don't move these pivot points, I don't care what shape you make this thing. You can make it look like an S. You can make it look like a hoop. I don't care. What, make it look like a snake. It doesn't matter. It's a stick figure. It's where the pivot points are. Right, coming out the instant center. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with the tire. That's coincidental. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just the, the point is that all these arcs need to coincide at the same instant center so that they all become radius of a giant circle that way that big so that everything is in the same system is the way it is mm -hmm. that's well it won't bind it'll cause the camber to change in ways you don't want it to yeah it won't actually bind right yeah the ideal place is something like this 
And, and this is drawn from Mustang 2 specs. Now, you hear the tie rod needs to be level. That isn't really true. If you think about this just a minute, that really isn't true. You'll hear that tie rod needs to be level. There's many other factors involved. And maybe coincidental that's level. And you can see that uh, you'll hear that a Mustang 2, the tie rod should be uh, parallel to the lower control arm. Well, that would be true if there were only two pieces. And in a McPherson strut, it is true. But see, this upper arm changes that action, doesn't it? It changes the way that works. So it's going to be near to level, but if it was level and parallel, they'd never meet, and you would violate all these conditions. Mm -hmm. Yes, it will. It will change. It will change, but we want it to. Right. And it'll change in a predictable way. Yeah, what he's saying is that, that the camber won't change in its tire, but it very much does. But going back to those drawings about how we get it to lean into a corner, by having this upper A-arm shorter and inclined downhill, it makes the wheels lean into the corner rather than out of the corner. That's how we're using that change to our advantage rather than dealing with a problem it creates. Let's go to a rear suspension, and this may help us. Uh, well, I think I may need to go to this board to really do this. Let's take that suspension. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how do you check if you have bump steer? Yeah, and what he's saying, put a piece of tape on your steering wheel, and you'll see that, and you'll feel that in the wheel the same way. The other way to do it, um, I remember one of the magazines had an article about a rack and pinion that was particularly poorly designed, and not trying to be an old at all, but I called the editor, and I said, have you guys done a bump steer check on this thing? I said, no. I said, okay. Just go out there, and you've got your toe inset, right? Bend the alignment shop. I'll say, okay, fine. Measure between the bulge of the tire and the front like we've all done to rough it in. And then just take a floor jacket, jack it up two inches. If it changed more than an eighth of an inch, you need to go to work. And they jacked it up, and it went, it went an inch and a quarter. So it sort of looked like that Maverick with that goofed-up deal. And just because it's got beautiful welding and full-color brochures by a big-name company, that's all terrific. But it doesn't change the engineering. You know, we've even seen some ads from some friendly competitors saying the Mustang II is obsolete. Well, says who? The laws of geometry and mathematics haven't changed since the Greeks were running around with togas, okay? It, you know, that's, that's marketing. That, that is not engineering. When, the, when the, the traction is right, when the, when the pivot point's in the right place, and it's getting the tire to the road, and we're not blurring our treads, we've done our job. You were used a very practical way to see it, because that's what the driver's going to see. I would tend to do that with a floor jack and measure the toe end change. Some people worry about 20 thousandths of an inch. In a real world, that's probably unrealistic. If you're racing for a championship, that means a few million dollars. Okay, then you got to worry about all those things. But in a real world, on roads with potholes and gravel and sand on them, hey, if you just go get the stinking car to go where you point it without an argument, you've done your job. But unfortunately, a lot of them don't. If you take a beautiful car like a 67 GTO, which Great car, super car. But you compare it to a modern car on a, on a road, they're just a hog. They're just terrible. And if all you've done is add horsepower and tires to it, I think you've made that car less safe than it was because the skinny tires used to keep you out of trouble. They were kind of like a fuse. You couldn't go fast enough to get in trouble. You know why you can't find a, a, 60, a 67 Mustang 390 fast back to restore? Most of them end up in cornfields on their tops because they wouldn't go around a corner. Yeah. I had two friends that lost them. My dad was a Ford dealer from 65 till 79, and I was working on those cars and washing those cars and driving those cars, and I remember how bad they really were. And it's a real revelation when you get out of a modern car, even you know, your family grocery getter, your go-to-work you know, rust rat that's front-wheel drive, five-year-old car or something, and then you get in a, a 60s muscle car and you go, oh, my God, how do we ever drive these things? They're, they're horrible. They're absolutely horrible. And, and just like uh, my 64 Falcon, this stuff is fixable. Uh, any other questions right now? Well, there, there's, there's many times there's engineering compromises. You know, uh, things are done for cost control. A short spindle weighs less than a tall spindle. It's less material used, and it saves a few pennies. And if you're dealing with, you know, bean counters, a few pennies is everything. You know, well, it can be. It can be just the fact on, like, on the Indy car, it didn't matter because of the way the car was driven. They knew if they were six degrees out of straight ahead, they were going to lose it anyway, so it didn't matter. So the compromise was to get more rubber on the road within the track limits they were given by rules. So sometimes the rules will limit you. There's a lot of things like that, and I know the factories know how, because you take a, six, uh, a really a 83, 87 Chevy pickup has one of the best suspensions you could possibly use. It is on the money geometry-wise. 
That's why they drive so nice, and that's why they've proven to be so popular. But S10, I mean, <laughs> trying to drive one of them on a two-lane road real fast. I had an S10 Jimmy out, put it, put it on its roof one night. You know, driving too fast, forgot that corner was coming. I about did that cornfield thing upside down my buddy was talking about. In fact, when my daughter went to driving it, case in point, I had put on some uh, pretty wide Z28 wheels. When I gave it to her to drive to college, I put on the stock skinny tires because then she didn't have traction to get in trouble. But this is real world. I'm not making this up. Okay, Brian says we got five. Let's do one other thing. This is a, a pet thing with me. Uh, we talked about the frame level to set the jack stands. But we often hear this about engine angles. And uh, there's a so-called three-degree sacred angle the engine should be installed in your chassis. Well, going back to this frame thing we talked about, if you set the engine at three degrees and then the car sits and you set your chassis level, you see you've lost that three degrees when it comes finished anyway. So you're, you've blown out the whole idea to begin with. That's another reason you set the chassis on the rake. The jack stands are not there to raise the car. The jack stands are there to push the floor down so you can get underneath it. When you think about it that way, that'll help you see it. You know, and as you get thicker, you young guys not feeling it now, but you need your jack stands a little taller as you get a few more miles on you sometimes. And, and that's the whole idea. We're pushing the floor down, not raising the car up. But we want to replicate the stance as close as we can. So now, really, you'd have to set the, cha the engine at six degrees with a, a level chassis to do this. Well, it looks goofy. It really does. And with a Ford engine, even with a dual sump pan, you still got an oil pump up front. You generally have to run maybe another couple degrees. Now you might have the engine at eight or nine degrees. Well, it's going to look really stupid. And your customer or your buddies or you come in the shop and it looks like you've done it wrong. But if you've got the nose down three degrees, like we said you should start, it's not so bad. Now, does it make any difference to the engine? No. You put them in a boat, they run an eight degree V drive. They don't change anything. The only thing they change is they do change the intake manifold cut because the whole idea is to get the carburetor float level so it works the best. But if you ever go up Whiteface Mountain, Vermont, or Pikes Peak out in Colorado, there's no place at the bottom where you put a wedge in your carburetor so it run up top. You've got but up and down steep driveway, so it really isn't that big a deal. In a perfect world where you have all the space, yes, this is something you should try to get. But if you've got to do a massive amount of cutting to put a, a 460 and a 56 Ford truck to get this so-called magic three degrees, if you can run it at four and a half degrees and you don't have to cut the floor, hey, that's what we do. You get as close to it as you can, it works okay.